Um, the establishment of a branch of the Royal Mint in Sydney was a direct response to the gold rushes following the discoveries of payable gold at the OFA in New South Wales and then later on at Ballarat and Bendigo Creek uh, in Victoria in 1851. What, what happened was that large quantities of unrefined gold began to circulate in the colony um, and traded as an unofficial currency or purchased by banks and shipped to England. So to protect that <coughs> currency and to maintain control of the economy, the colonial government asked for a branch of the Royal Mint to be established in Sydney. Now, after some debate and a similar request from Victoria, approval was given in 1853 for the first overseas branch of the Royal Mint. And in uh, April 53, Sir John Herschel, who was the master of the Royal Mint in London, asked this man, Captain Edward Wollstoneholm Ward, Royal Engineer, to report on proposals for the establishment of a mint, uh, which Ward did and made the report, completed it, and had it accepted all within a month, and then was uh, appointed as head of the Sydney branch uh, of the Royal Mint. So his formal title was Deputy Master, Deputy to the uh, London. He was a military man born in Calcutta, eldest son of the Honourable John Petty Ward of the Bengal Civil Service, and grandson of the first Lord Bangor of Castle Ward in County Down in Ireland, which some people will know as a National Trust <coughs> uh, property. He was educated at the Royal Military Academy in Woolwich, where he won prizes in mathematics, and at the School of Military Engineering in Chatham, where he studied engineering and architecture. So when Ian was talking about the military tradition and architecture this morning, Ward's a little layer of that as well. Um, he was commissioned a lieutenant in the Royal Engineers in 1841 and served for a little while in Bermuda before studying mining and metallurgy at the Government School of Mines in London. Um, the Royal Engineers actually assisted in the preparation and management of the Great Exhibition of 1851, including the construction of the Crystal Palace building. building. And as part of that uh, contingent, Ward was appointed Secretary to the Department of Mines. And in this slide, you see the medals from, that he was given as part of that. And this is a uh, slide showing the um, uh, you know, visitors to the exhibition. And you will see, those of you who know this building, you will see several elements of that structure that are, that are still uh, retained in this building, including the trusses and the um, columns. So Ward was responsible for the initial design of the Sydney Mint buildings and, and perhaps drawing on his experience of the prefabrication of the Crystal Palace building, he commissioned building components for shipment to Sydney and, and these major structural elements uh, like the columns and the girders are identical, just except a different paint scheme really, as far as we can tell. Uh, he also commissioned machinery, uh, rolling mills, cutting out machines, coining presses, balances and a crushing mill from leading British engineering firms and he recruited skilled staff, uh, chemists and assayers uh, and also given a detachment of sappers and miners specially trained to assemble the prefabricated building components and also to serve as the industrial workforce and it was also important in an era of gold rush that they were subject to military discipline so a little bit harder to run off to the diggings. And he then he uh, supervised the um, shipment of materials and equipment and personnel to Sydney. He also um, drew an elevation, a renaissance revivaled elevation, did this in uh, November 1853 before he left England. Um, he got here in October 54 and soon after landing in Sydney he uh, commandeered the officers quarters at Dawes Point Battery. Uh, it was probably, you know, next to Government House, the best water view in Sydney at the time, and he quickly gained a place on Sydney Society's A-list. That's relevant in terms of the, the status of the Mint and the role of the Mint. Um, and he particularly he renewed his earlier acquaintance with the Governor, uh, a fellow Royal Engineer, Sir William Dedison. He was nominated, actually, as a member of the Legislative Council for 1855-56. So he was a military man who to combine his duties as a civil servant with membership of the New South Wales Legislative Council. And for some, this might have seemed a conflict of interest, but not for Ward, because he was an imperial civil servant, uh, and he answered directly to the British Treasury, and his job ultimately was a political one. He had to get the Sydney Mint up and running, processing gold from the diggings in New South Wales and Victoria, uh, and he also had to establish the Sydney Sovereign as a legal tender throughout the Australian colonies. That took him a couple of years. He managed to do it by 1857. Now, he wasn't the first of the mint, uh, new mint people to arrive in Sydney. Um, 
by the time he'd got here, the site for the mint had already been chosen by Joseph Trickett, who was the superintendent of the coining factory, and he'd arrived with an advance party in March 1854. Trickett had been a civil engineer working in the British government for the British government in Gibraltar when he got his Sydney mint appointment. So he had the job of selecting a site, supervising the unloading of the prefabricated components and getting construction underway. And within a week of arrival, he was offered various sites by the colonial surveyor. There was a vacant site next to the colonial secretary's office in Bridge Street. Up on the left of the slide, I put a little blue box around it. Um, but the problem was that this site was also being considered as a site for the town hall. And in fact, the map shows the town hall is occupying, but it was vacant at the time. There was also some space next to Victoria Barracks and then some disposable land down near the cattle market, which you see in the, in the inset on the bottom of the slide. And then, just as they were trying to argue about the uh, Bridge Street site, a decision was made to relocate military headquarters from Sydney to Melbourne, and, that, and Trickett was told that the building, this front building, then occupied as brigade staff officers, uh, would be available. So, and it, also the cheapest option, since there was an existing building that could be adapted for use as the Mint offices. So this is um, Trickett's plan showing the proposed conversion of the staff offices into Mint offices and also the buildings for the manufactory. Um, in fact, it's, it's Trickett's plan, but it's very similar to a block plan that Ward had drawn in, in England in November 1853, which showed this symmetrical arrangement around a courtyard where you have a uh, melting room, coining department, workshops, and then the front offices uh, with quarters at, for the Royal Sappers and Miners at the rear of the site and a police station and guard uh, rooms at the front of the site. You don't see those in this drawing. Ward had, had instructed Trickett to explain to the New South Wales Governor that it was necessary to definitely fix parts of the building which were to contain the machinery. Uh, before the machinery could be ordered and those parts couldn't be changed. So that everything except the front office building, the structure of it, the, the layout, uh, was determined in advance. Uh, but the, uh, but the, but the uh, rest of it could be uh, altered to suit the locality in which um, the, the site might be, um, the mint might be placed. So Rick Trickett wasn't constrained by Ward's elevation. He was given permission also to quarry stone and for the new buildings from a quarry in the outer domain, so just behind us. But he also drew a new elevation um, and proposed elevation to present staff offices, proposed to be reconverted into mint offices. It's another version of a Renaissance revival civic building um, with an additional touch. And what I've, what's on the bottom of the uh, slide, probably not legible to you is the centre pediment to be surmounted by a statue of His Excellency, the Governor-General, under whose governorship the Sydney Mint was first formed. However, this is the Mint as it was built. <laughs> Possibly one of the earliest photographs, this is by Robert Hunt, one of the mint, uh, chemists at the Mint. Uh, this is the economy option. Uh, just the addition of what were called two ornamental lodges, one for the police and one for the military guard. They were thought, uh, one newspaper commented, to, impose a, an impart, to impart an imposing air to the street view of this important public uh, department. You'll also see that there's a sentry box near that stair on the right with a sentry standing outside the box. Uh, and you can get a better sense of how imposing these structures were in this uh, later image, not much altered, but uh, just a little bit later. Although it's possibly more fortress-like than ornamental, perhaps. Now, it's, it's an industrial workplace, um, and uh, we're lucky that one of the first employees of the Mint, Mint, Mint William Stanley Jevons, was a, uh, amongst several of the other employees, was a keen amateur photographer, amongst the first amateur photographers in these very early years of photography. And he, two albums of his early photographs taken in 1857-58 at the Mint, survive in the uh, Rylands Library at the University of Manchester. And in this photograph, you can see some of the co key um, components of that industrial workplace, the coining press, rolling mills, a cutting out press, and an assay balance. One of the stories that's most important about the Mint is, first of all, that importance of the survival of those prefabricated components. 
uh, but also the role of the Mint in those early years in terms of its contribution to the um, to colonial science, in terms of creating a critical mass around colonial science uh, in that period where most of the institutions had, uh, had been um, a week and then the gold rush had kind of killed off anything much. Uh, and so one of the elements of that was the processes that happened around uh, assaying. And this is a photograph of Jevons himself with a tray of couples and then a little tray of couples that Fiona has kind of put together to match the photograph coming from the archaeology. And then also there's a uh, 1853, a second edition of a um, gold mining and assaying guide for emigrants. Uh, so that's significant because what happened was that the Sydney Mint had two full-time assayers employed as part of the establishment, Francis Boyer Miller and William Stanley Jevons. But when they first received their appointments, they were offered retainers of £100 per annum and expected to establish their own independent assay office and to undertake private work for banks and businesses as well as for the Mint on peace rates. That was the arrangement in London where... Miller's elder brother, actually, William Allen Miller, was a non-resident assayer at the Royal Mint and the Bank of England while also serving as professor of chemistry at King's College London. Uh, so Miller arrived in the colony three months before Jevons and he established an uh, assay laboratory in Bly Street. And then a few months later, Jevons set up his apparatus and his uh, acids in a room in Church Street. He'd barely completed his fit out when in late January 1855, Ward proposed a revision of the arrangements and offered offered them both full-time positions. He'd realised that in the competitive climate of the gold rushes, he had to monopolise those, their skills, particularly when the interest of the Treasury is to maintain the integrity of the sovereign. The example from the Californian gold fields, just a little bit earlier, is that you had hundreds of private mints operating on the Californian gold fields, and so one coin from one mint was not necessarily of the same value from a coin from another mint. There are a couple of uh, gold assays in private practice in Sydney at the beginning of 1855, but as I said, Ward couldn't ensure the integrity of the Sydney sovereign without Miller and Jevons, who'd had special training in the ways of the Royal Mint. And then, having secured their services as full-time employees, he directed them to teach the assay pro process to the Mint clerks. So that, in fact, there were a layer, generation of clerks and even one of the corporals from the sappers and miners who learnt assaying from Jevons and Miller, well, Miller in particular, because Jevons was here for only a few years. And then they later, later became assayers for various colonial banks or on the Thames Goldfield in New Zealand. Um, and one of them went on to become a um, foundation instructor in chemistry at the Ballarat School of Mines in 1871. Several of the uh, Mint staff were also members of the Philosophical Society, which was the precursor for the Royal Society of New South Wales. Uh, and in fact, it was only two months after the officiating at the opening of the Mint that um, the scientifically minded Governor Denison enlisted the aid of Captain Ward together with Professor John Smith from Sydney University, Professor of Chemistry, um, to revive the uh, Austra Australian Philosophical Society and they, they restarted the Philosophical Society of New South Wales, hoping to provide a forum for original papers on subjects of science, art, literature <coughs> and philosophy. And Ward clearly encouraged his staff to support the society. He may even have directed some of them to join because all his uh, three senior officers were proposed for membership at the first meeting. Um, but, you know, others, like the people shown in this photograph, they're all members of the society. There's Trickett on the uh, top left, Knipe, who's the accountant on the right, um, and then there's Joseph um, Henry Augustus Seven on the left. He's one of the clerks who became an assayer. Uh, Jevons in the middle and then Robert Hunt, the chemist, on the right. Um, but people like Knight probably just, uh, you know, served to keep up the numbers, but the other, all of the other Mint men, including others who joined later, joined specialist subcommittees. Uh, some took part in the photographic conversaciones, it was a kind of scientific uh, practice then, and some presented papers to the Society's monthly meeting. Uh, Ward himself was elected as one of the secretaries of the society together, together with Professor Smith. He was an active member of the Microscopical Committee. Um, and under, um, under his leadership, the Mint played the role of government analytical, de facto government analytical laboratory. 
uh, so that when two Sydney gentlemen exhibited a specimen of artificial stone at a meeting of the society, Denison ordered, uh, directed Ward to conduct experiments at the Mint about its qualities. Uh, and then he Ward then went on to derive, devise a series of experiments on the strength and elasticity of colonial timbers, which were still being uh, cited by Joseph Maiden at the Botanic Gardens in the early 20th century. There are other experiments, you know, on combustible material, coal, etc. But um, beyond their experimental activities at the Mint, several of the Mint employees made significant uh, individual contributions of, to colonial science and most notable and the, the name most people know today is William Stanley Jevons who was not quite 20 years old when he arrived in Sydney in October 1854 and while he, he stayed here less than five years but in that time he made a pioneering foray into the area of scientific meteorology. Um, he built an apparatus for simulating clouds in miniature in, in his office in the Mint and reported some of his um, results and papers in the London Philosophical ma Magazine. He wrote a long essay on Australian climatology and wrote letters to the Sydney press on lead in the Sydney water supply, on gunpowder and lightning, and a partial eclipse of the sun. He also conducted a single-handed social survey of Sydney and experimented in the new art of wet plate photography. Um, and he took panoramic views of Sydney from the roof of the Mint building as well as portraits of his Mint colleagues, several of which we see in this presentation. After he left Australia, he went on to be develop an international reputation as an economist and logician. Now, Ward also took pictures. The top picture on the left is one of uh, Jevons' photographs. He did take a visit to the diggings around Braidwood before he left the colony. Uh, but in May, June 1860, Captain Ward and Professor Smith toured the goldfields to gather information about quartz crushing. Um, in many places, the surface diggings of alluvial gold had been exhausted by that time, and miners were looking for expert scientific advice on the development of machinery to extract gold from quartz reef. Uh, and in fact, a proposal was put to the New South Wales uh, government a thousand pounds be set aside for the mint to experiment with uh, auriferous quartz and an experimental quartz crushing machine was erected mint in September uh, 61. So members of the public could bring in their samples, small quantities had to be less than two tonnes to be roasted and crushed and washed and the gold collected from tables and troughs and was troughs and it was um, three guineas a tonne. But in these photographs which uh, the two that are shown as uh, um, stereographs, they're all stereographs. The one on the bottom is Ward driving the cart and Smith standing behind it. And then the top one in the diggings is Smith sitting on the front right. By making the assay as full-time civil servants, Ward was able to create an in-house technical training school uh, and he also bought the opportunity to experiment with improvements in the assay process itself. Now, Jevons did that through a series of trials in 1857 um, but it was carried forward by Francis Boyer Miller, the other um, assayer, and uh, he uh, joined the Philosophical Society in November 1859 and in July 1860 read a paper before the Society on the detection of spurious gold, especially a series of fake gold nuggets then in circulation in the, in the colony. But his scientific crowning, uh, crowning scientific achievement was the development of a process of refining and toughening gold by means of chlorine gas. He painted and patented that process in London in June 1867, registered as an invention before the New South Wales Legislative Assembly later that year, and then wrote papers for scientific journals around the world. And by December 69, his method had been successfully put into practice at the Sydney Mint and at the Bank of New Zealand in Auckland, and then into the English, American and Norwegian mints. And he traveled to England and the US to advise on the process. Now, in, in, uh, by the 60s, Victoria did get its own mint, and in uh, 1869, a decision was made to establish a branch in Melbourne, and Ward, now Colonel Ward, was appointed the first deputy master there, uh, and tasked with supervising its establishment, just as he'd done 15 years earlier in Sydney. And two of the senior men from the Sydney Mint, Robert Hunt, the chemist, and Francis Miller, the assayer, were transferred to Melbourne, uh, where Hunt became superintendent of the bullion office. So the Melbourne Mint opened in June 
1872 on the corner of La Trobe and William Street, and the other corner is uh, Little Lonsdale Street. Um, I think you can tell from this that it's a rather symmetrical structure with a main administration building fronting William Street, and then a series of, you can, I think you can infer the series of um, buildings on either side at the back with the chimneys, and then the front uh, ornamental lodges or guard houses. Uh, it was actually built by the Victorian Public Works Office and the administration building, Ward finally got his Renaissance Revival um, building, was designed by architect J.J. Clark. And the site comprised four structures built around a square, uh, a melting department, the assay department, the coining department and the administration building, which incorporated the deputy master's residence. And there were all two, also two corner guard houses, rather uh, larger than the Sydney ones, and palisading and a perimeter wall. The only structure that remains today is the administration building. Uh, I think that's really significant. It means that it, it might have been a more glamorous building from Ward's point of view, but what survives here is much, a much more substantial component of the structure of a uh, mint from that time. And this is just to see that shape again. Ian had this slide earlier this morning. This is a view of the mint from St James Tower, um, 1861 or 62. So you can see again that symmetrical structure that you can uh, get a sense of there as well. Now after Ward's uh, departure from Sydney, the new deputy master in Sydney was Charles Eloy, who'd been superintendent of the Bullion Office and had previously been registrar and accountant of the Royal Mint in London. He was a bit of a straight down the line in terms of what he thought the role of the mint should be. And he questioned the uh, propriety of making mineral assays unconnected with the coinage uh, at the Sydney Mint, which is what Ward had introduced in 1861. He also questioned the value of the quartz crushing machine, um, arguing in 1872 that the utility was now questionable when adequate quartz, quartz crushing machinery was being erected on all the gold fields. Besides, he said, its position was never very suitable, being immediately under the windows of a sick ward in the infirmary. Now, Ward retired, um, Eloy retired at the end of 1877, and Hunt returned from Melbourne to become deputy master. He was the first of the deputy masters to live at the Mint, taking up his residence in the official quarters in the front building in January 1879, just a month before this photograph was taken. And what you see here is the scale of the work, which is just taken out here, this photograph, is the scale of the workforce at that time. It's 39 officers and workmen, including nine men who'd been part of the original 1854-55 contingent. Um, and also three father and son combinations. That was once a common feature of small industrial enterprises. Uh, but that, and that's pretty much, give or take a few, the size of the workforce throughout the rest of the history of the Mint until its closure. So what you're seeing in the background of the image is the melting house and Sydney Hospital beyond, the crush and the crushing room on the right. And also what you might notice is that the back veranda is no longer open, colonnade, and it's been enclosed. And that happened late 60s, 70, 71. It was, it, it was apparently in poor condition at that time, or so Eloise said, but in any case, they took advantage of it to get more accommodation for offices and other uses. Now, I said uh, um, Hunt moved into the Mint, uh, and, but he'd, he'd been one of those pioneers of amateur photography in the 50s, and he maintained that interest for the rest of his life. And this is a photograph taken from the Mint in March 1886, when uh, Macquarie Street is having wooden blocks laid down as paving. Uh, the Sydney Globe had quite a sort of uh, satirical kind of description of this. It said, should not the most beautiful street in the whole city have the most perfect pavement? Should, should the shopkeeper who lives in Newtown and the clerk who lodges in Crown Street journey home on a floor of wood mm -hmm. and His Excellency the Governor and His Honour the Speaker and all the councillors and legislators and doctors and divines and hospital patients mm -hmm. and leisurely visitors to the Domain and Picture Gallery make the last stage of their journey through rough and rude Macadam. Um, but it cost twice as much to put wooden blocks as rough and rude Macadam, but nevertheless, that's what happened. And this is uh, Hunt's dining room in his quarters at the Mint in 1887. Hunt died in office uh, in his quarters in 1892, nearly 40 years after he'd started work at the Mint as a young man of 24. And it's kind of, it's almost the end of an era for the Sydney Mint. 
Because what happens is that early in the 20th century, there's a series of proposals to relocate the mint. To Dawes Point is one, to the observatory is one, to the outer domain and to Glebe Island near the abattoirs. Uh, the state government saw the mint as the odd man out in Macquarie Street, situated in the midst of the principal public buildings of the state, Parliament House, Sydney Hospital, Law Courts, Public Library, Department of Justice, etc. It's very interesting that the hospital is a, is a principal public building. So the site was wanted for new law courts, and besides, the establishment of the mint would remove the smoke nuisance frequently complained of by the residents of the neighbourhood. So in 1909, the Royal Commission for the Improvement of the City of Sydney and its suburbs recommended de demolition of the Mint Building and Hyde Park Barracks as part of the beautification of the city. The intention was to widen Macquarie Street, construct new law courts and remodel Parliament House and also a street through the domain you can see in this plan. But the question of removal, relocation raised an issue for London about the very necessity of continuing a branch mint in Sydney, especially because the States of Australia were now combined into a Commonwealth. Uh, and since the Perth branch had started work in 1899, the Sydney branch had only struck 29.7% of the total gold coinage in Australia. So it was hardly, from the point of view of London, hardly the time to go building a new mint uh, in Sydney. Now, in 1914, at the outbreak of World War I, the mint site was still intended for law courts, but those plans you know, were put on hold for the duration of the war. So what we saw at the beginning of the war was a small industrial workforce with, uh, comprising 18 salaried staff, um, the deputy master, superintendent, assayers, clerks and foremen, and 24 workmen on wages. They were graded as first, second or third class and worked either in the melting room or the coining factory. Um, now, six of those men listed in the AIF uh, were six of them who enlisted in the AIF were third class workmen, uh, earning between five and eight shillings a day. They were aged between 15 and 17 when they started work at the Mint, and, and one of them, except for one who was 18 or 19, and they were all 18 or 19 when they enlisted, although um, some of them claimed to be older on their attestation papers. The one clerk who enlisted put his age down because he was nearly 39. The uh, Sina, Sydney Mint Honour Roll hangs in the Southern Stair Hall. I'm sure many people have been past it. If you look at the, uh, the little um, coat of arms on the top of the Honour Roll, that, that is the coat of arms of the Royal Mint. Um, so it carries the name of the seven men entered in the order on the date in which they enlisted. Uh, and it uh, notes that three were wounded and that one, Oliver Whiting, uh, had been killed in action. Oliver Whiting was a third generation Mint employee. His father and his grandfather were in that 1879 photograph. And these are the, you can see in this and the next photograph what I'm, what I'm talking about when I'm talking about these young men who are the uh, third grade workmen, etc. This is, um, this is a photograph published in the Sydney Sun on the 30th of June 1926. The Mint closed in 19 end of 1926, but it, the talk of its closing had been going for several years. By that time, Melbourne was, the Melbourne Mint was the one where most work was happening. That had, Sydney had kind of made some uh, uh, improvements in its rate, but it was kind of all over. Uh, and this image was published in the Sun under the heading, Today is the Mint's last day for gold, and, and the caption, rolling bars into strips out of which coins are to be punched. And this is an, uh, another one where you see a workman using a blank blanking press to cut coins from a fillet of gold and holding, and another one, the same man, I think, holding sizzles, the fillets. Okay, so the Mint closed in December 1826. Uh, various um, government departments moved into the rooms. The law courts never did come here. Um, but the question of demolition was never quite uh, far away and never, you know, off the table. And so what you see in this slide is a few examples of the response of part of society, part of um, Sydney community, to that idea of, to the idea of Sydney, old Sydney, uh, the the, the uh, vanishing landmarks, lost Sydney, etc. So there's a uh, wood engraving by Raymond McGrath, an etching by Fred Britton, and an etching by Gayfield Shaw. That the uh, one on the um, bottom left. Uh, it's one of a series of etchings of vanishing landmarks that Shaw made of Sydney, and they were published in the Telegraph. 
picturesque features from the old colonial days. Um, and one of the catalysts for Shaw's project was the demolition in August 1933 of, of the Ma uh, Macquarie Street Mansion, Burdekin House. And just final slide, a view of Queen's Square around the time that the Mint is show, uh, closed, perhaps a little bit, perhaps 27, don't have an exact date. You can see it's when the, um, St, the underground St James Station has been built because you see the Queen Square entrance to St James Station, which of course doesn't exist anymore. But also the reason why this slide is here is that showing uh, beside the Mint are uh, these chimney points, the chimneys, the tall chimneys. Um, there's a, it's an industrial, the Mint's long since closed, but the chimneys are still there. One of them is actually a chimney from the Sydney Hospital, not from the Mint, but the Mint got to blame. Uh, it was not demolished until May 1941 during the Second World War as an uh, air raid precaution measure. And by that time, the press was re regretting the loss of this nostalgic, romantic element from the past. Thank you.